subject. Good, you hear me? Okay. So we've been discussing for a while at this point already, Betochen and Ishtadlis. Um So I think it may be time for another topic, but a topic that's connected to what we've been talking about until now. Um, over the course of these past number of weeks, uh, something has been brought up a number of times, which is the concept of Gilgulam, reincarnation, which is a very important subject to understand when it comes to Ishtadlis versus Betochen, because what became clear, hopefully, over these number of weeks is that there, there is a certain, you know, there are certain things that, are, that every single person, every single Jewish neshama, Jewish soul, and Jewish person has to accomplish and has to work through in their lifetime. So, you know, with that being said, there's also hishtadlos and there's also free will. So we've been talking about how Hashem sort of has to balance these two, uh, these two aspects of reality. On the one hand, there are certain things which has to, which have to be accomplished. And on the other hand, uh, you know, where there is such a thing as free will. So something that has, been, that, that has been mentioned often is that one of the ways how Hashem, you know, works out uh, the system is by using the concept of Gugulam, which means that if a person, let's say, for whatever reason, you use his free will in such a way where he did not accomplish what he was supposed to accomplish, we'll talk about what, what are you supposed to accomplish, because again, we'll, this will be part of our discussion. But if a person uses free will and does not accomplish what he needs to accomplish, then there's such a thing as being sent back down a second, a third, a, you know, a hundredth time, theoretically, in order to accomplish what they need to accomplish. And we've mentioned over the, oh, you know, I think it was last week you talked about how certain, there are certain signs how a person has to know, you know, that a person can use to figure out what exactly he's supposed to accomplish in this lifetime. We talked about what makes a person happy, uh, certain talents. Um, but I think, I think we have to spend a little bit of time on the topic in general, Google him, uh, because as we'll see, it's a very, very fundamental one. It's a very, very fundamental one. So to begin such a discussion uh, with trepidation, obviously, because it's a very, very difficult and deep topic um, on our level, I think what we have to talk about at least this week, and, and we'll see if we could finish it, I don't, I don't know, we'll see, maybe it might take a couple weeks to at least even, even start, is to figure out who exactly we are. When a person says, I, you know, I am hungry, you know, I want to do this and this, who am I? What is a person exactly? You know, there's a story they say with the, uh, the Balatanya, Valtani once had his grandson, the Tzernach Tzedek, as a small child on his, uh, on his lap, and the Tzernach Tzedek was playing, and the Tzernach Tzedek pulled on his beard, and he said, Zaydi. So the Valtani said, no, that's not Zaydi, that's Zaydi's beard. Okay, so the Tzernach Tzedek, you know, uh, he was a smart kid, so he pulled on the Valtani's arm, and he said, Zaydi. And the Valtani said, no, that's Zaydi's arm, that's not Zaydi. Then this went on with different, uh, different, you know, his jacket and so on, you know, and this is how it went. So once the Tzernach Tzedek finally caught what to do. So the kid got off his grandfather's lap, goes to the door, and starts playing with the hinges of the door. And he pretends, the kid pretends to hurt his finger, to, have, to get his finger stuck in the door. And he starts screaming, Zadie, Zadie. And then, you know, the Valtani gets up quickly, Mendel, what's going on? Are you okay? And the kid says, oh, that's Zadie. That's Zadie. So what is a person, really? Because the Valtani is right. If a person identifies himself, who am I? I am my head? No, that's my head. That's not who I am. Who is a person? What is a person? So growing up in yeshiva, I'm sure we've all heard, uh, you know, I'm sure we're all familiar with this concept, that we're all composed of two things. There's the body and the soul, and the shama and the gush. And then there's other things that get thrown in the mix. There's the yeh tov and the tahara. So who am I exactly? I'm the yeh tov. Am I the yeh tahara? Maybe some of us in yeshiva felt that uh, our abeim were telling us that we are the yeh tahara. But so what, we're, what is a person exactly? How many different components are there? You know, this, the, you know like, the, like the classical thing, a little angel on the right shoulder, a little angel on the left. So who are you? Who are you? So, so it's complicated. It's complicated. This is a discussion that's talked at great length by the Mukubalim, a great, great length. What is a person? And how many, how many different factors are there going on within a person at all times? Uh, so generally speaking, it's as follows. Uh, again, just to speak very, very quickly on our level. Uh, and again, I don't know if I'll be able to go, to go through each different part of what a person is, in, in, definitely not completely, but even to, 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 talk, to touch a little bit on each part today, I don't know. But we'll start like this. Um, we all know we have a body. So that, that, that I don't think needs much explanation as far as the physical aspect of what a human being is. The DNA, the biology, the you know, just the the, the the physical aspect of what a person is, the goof, that doesn't need much explanation. We all have a body. Some, you know, some are healthier than others, but generally speaking, they're all pretty much uh, made in the same mold, relatively. 
Uh, so that's the body. That, that we don't need to talk about at great length. Now, as far as the other aspects of what comprise a person, the soul, if you will. So the truth is like this. So there's a very, very, very important teaching from the Arizal. It's not really from the Ari. It goes before the Ari as well. It's talked about in the Zayar. Ramesha Cardevero, who was one of the greatest Mukhabon of, of all time before the Ari, already talks about this. The Arizal just expanded on it. That every single Jew, again, great or small, Tzadik, Russia, it doesn't make a difference. If a person is Jew, a person is a Jew, we have two separate souls. There are two separate souls. Soul number one, which is real, which is which is somewhat on the same uh, on the same par as the soul that's shared by all of humanity, is something that's called an animal soul. And that's Bahamas is an animal soul. That's something. That's a soul that all Jews have, and really all human beings have. And as we'll, I'll, I'll mention, uh, and I'll, as I'll try to explain very very soon. That soul is really something that all animal life has. All plant, everything, even angels have such a soul. I'll explain what that means in a second. There's the animal soul on one side. And now what's unique about the Jewish people is that on top of that animal soul, which again, all of humanity shares, again, there might be a little difference between the Jew and a non-Jew in that soul, but just generally speaking, all of humanity shares the animal soul. On top of that, the Jewish person is given a godly soul. Now we have to first discuss what is the animal soul? What is the animal soul? And then what is the godly soul on top of that? So what is an animal soul? So the, the, there's a safer, again, I mentioned the greatest, one of the greatest Mkubalim, the Ramak, Ramosha Kardavero. So Ramosha Kardavero, he lived in Tzvat right before the Arizal. He was the leader of the Mkubalim in Tzvat right before the emergence of the Ari. Um, he is considered to be one of the greatest Mkubalim of all time. He wrote his, his magnum opus, if you will, it's called the Sefer Pardes Rimonim. The, the, the uh, Pardes Rimonim is called the, the Pomegranate Orchard. That type of part of the Jerusalem is basically an encyclopedic work of all the Kabbalistic concepts that have that has that has developed until his time. So if you learn the part of the Jerusalem, you get a pretty good sense about what the you know what the body of work of Kabbalah was until the Arizal. And then the Arizal you know expanded on it much much further. In the part of the Jerusalem, the Ramak Moshe Kardavir talks about the animal soul, and he explains the following way. And this is where, this is to explain what the animal soul is. Every single element of reality, every rock, every atom, every molecule, every single thing in reality, as we mentioned already a number of times, only exists because Hashem's light, Hashem's desire is being infused and pumped into that atom, that molecule, every single second. We talked about this. So if Hashem were to, you know, in, in one second, were, were to, to uh, stop willing you know, this computer that I'm, that I'm speaking to, if Hashem were to stop willing this into existence, then every single molecule and atom that's comprised in, in creating this computer would cease to exist. Every single thing in reality, every element, is, is only existing because there's a light of Hashem, there's the energy of Hashem that's being infused into that reality. That, that's, that's one of the basic, basic fundamental teachings of Torah. Of Torah. So the Ramak explains that if that's true, so theoretically, if let's say you have a rock on one hand, right? Now this rock, if it exists, it's because Hashem's, there's a, some aspect of Hashem's energy that's infused into this rock, giving it existence. On the other hand, you have, uh, I don't know, a cup of water. And also, the water exists because every single molecule of water is being infused with the light of Hashem, with the energy of Hashem. Said the Ramak, the concept of an animal soul is as follows. If you take enough elements, and you combine them together to create a more sophisticated uh, structure, right? Then all those lights of Hashem, the energies of Hashem, which were existing in each individual piece, just like on a physical in a physical way, when you take all the little pieces together, you create something more sophisticated. So, so too the energy of Hashem that was infused in each and every specific piece, when they come together in a more sophisticated object the energy of Hashem also becomes more sophisticated, so to speak. So, for example, uh, the energy of Hashem that's giving existence, that exists within a rock, is somewhat very simple. It's very, very simple. The reason why an animal has a higher level of consciousness than a rock, not because it has like a soul or some deep thing to it. The reason is because an animal, the body of an animal is a more sophisticated object than a rock, meaning... An animal is comprised of many, many different elements and many, many different moving parts to create such a thing, a body called an animal. So because the structure of the physical side of the animal is sophisticated, so therefore the energy of Hashem that's giving light to every specific part of this sophisticated 
you know, machine called an animal, that energy of Hashem is also more sophisticated than it is in a rock or in a cup of water. It's that higher level of sophistication, that higher level of Hashem's light that's, that's being infused in this more sophisticated structure called an animal, that's what gives it its consciousness. And said the Ramak, that's exactly the, the, the source of consciousness for an animal. That's the source of consciousness for an angel. In other words, an angel and an animal are both very, very similar in the fact that their level of consciousness is existing be, due to the high level of sophistication of their bodies. I mean, just like an animal, the body of an animal is more sophisticated than a rock. And because of that, the level of energy of Hashem that has to be infused to give life to that object that animal to the body of an animal is also more sophisticated and therefore it gives it a certain level of consciousness so too it is with an angel an angel is just the body of an angel is that much more sophisticated than an animal and therefore the consciousness that an angel experiences is all the more so sophisticated this is what's called an animal soul just like an animal has this a human body as well a human body just the body itself of a person is a very sophisticated structure it's much more sophisticated than a cup of water and it's because it's more sophisticated to, it, to the extent of its sophistication, to that extent, it needs the light of Hashem to be, in, to be also sophisticated when it's, when it's giving life to such a body. So again, just, I, I know this is a little bit out there, but this is what Hather Ramak explains what an animal soul means. An animal soul is not like there's an empty shell and Hashem infuses a soul into it. An animal soul, in other words, is basically the light of Hashem that's through and through part of all elements of reality. It's just when you combine many simple elements to create something more sophisticated, then the light of Hashem, which you're also combining with these elements, also becomes more sophisticated, and it creates a consciousness. That's the consciousness of an animal, and that's the consciousness of even an angel, and that's the basic consciousness of what a, of a human being is. The animal soul that every single person has all humanity have, and all animals have, is different. What, it, what the purpose of that soul is to give a person his, a, con, a level of consciousness. It keeps the body functioning, it keeps the person alive, the, the heart pumping, a level of consciousness, his personality, his memory, everything that makes a person a person. What makes a human being unique and a human being is coming from the animal soul. But what's unique, what the Ramaki is explaining, though, however, is that this animal soul is basically in the same ballpark as the, as the as what gives as the level of consciousness by an animal as well. It's just it's just more more sophisticated. It's higher because the body of a human being is more sophisticated than an animal. So as far as this soul is concerned, it's very very simple. Again, I mean it, it, it's on the same ballpark as an animal, and therefore it doesn't make a human being you know this supreme spiritual entity. It basically makes the human being a more sophisticated cow. That's pretty much what the animal soul does. As far as that soul is concerned, that very much is connected with the body. So again, uh, I don't know if this is, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm being clear 100%, but this is, but this is what, this is how the Ramak uh, explains what the animal soul is. Now, on top of the animal soul, and this is where, where the higher level of what a Jew comes into play, is that on top of the animal soul, besides the basic level of godliness, which is infused in every element of reality, and therefore when a bunch of elements get together and become sophisticated, that level of, of, of Hashem's light and energy also becomes more sophisticated. On top of that, Hashem infused into a Jewish person, and specifically a Jewish person, something called a godly soul. Now the godly soul that's infused within every single Jew is way, way beyond just the light of Hashem that's connected within rocks and within blades of grass, and within water molecules. It's much more sophisticated than that. That, animal, that godly soul, the main function of that is not to keep a person alive. The main function of that is to connect the person to, a, to the higher world. That's the main function of the godly soul. When it comes to Gugu, when it comes to reincarnation, that's a discussion about the nature of the godly soul. And this is an important distinction to make. What makes a person, what keeps a person alive, the animal soul that keeps a person alive, that keeps all human beings alive, which, which doesn't make us that much more superior to animals. As far as that soul is concerned, it's earthly bound. That's an earthly bound soul. It's very much connected to the body and it's, because its whole purpose is just to keep the body functioning. And if the body, you know, stops functioning, the person passes away, then the, the animal soul is, is uh, insignificant. What's significant, what makes a human being way beyond an animal 
and even way beyond an angel, is the fact that besides the animal soul which we have, we also have this godly soul, which acts as a bridge to connect us to Hashem in an unbelievably deep way. It's that godly soul which gives us our unique, our unique mission in life. It's that godly soul which gives us a unique connection to Hashem that no other Jew or no other people can experience. It's the godly soul that the discussion of Gugum comes. Everything that makes us unique and what makes the Jewish people special, it's all about the godly soul. It's all about the godly soul. Um, so again, the God, and now as far as how many, you know, what's the nature of the godly soul, how many parts are there and so on, that's, we're going to be talking about that future in, 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 in coming weeks, hopefully. But this is just to lay the groundwork. So again, so far we have three parts to ourselves. We have the physical body, fine. We have an animal soul, which is, which is intimately bound to the physical body, okay? And then infused within the vessel of the body, we have this unbelievably supreme, uh, you know, unfathomable concept, which is called the godly soul, the godly soul. So, so far, it's basically three things. Body, animal soul, pretty much connected, and godly soul. Now, where's the Eitz Tov and the Eitz Tahara coming? So, the Eitz Tov and the Eitz Tahara are not who you are. That's not who you are. Who are you? You, basically, you, you, when a person says I or I say you, it means three things. There's the body, there's the animal soul, and there's the godly soul. That's who a person is. The Eitz Tov and the Eitz Tahara are outside forces that are not who we are, technically, that Hashem infused within us, that Hashem sort of puts within us to give us, to balance our free will. So, let me explain. The body and the animal soul, because they're earthbound, they're very much drawn to physical life, very much drawn to physical life. A person naturally, you know, when he's born, he has a body, and has an animal soul. The animal soul, the instincts of the animal soul are very animal-like. They're drawn to food, to pleasure, to relaxation. That's the animal soul is about. The godly soul, on the other hand, because it's not intimately connected with the body, it's coming from a much, much deeper place. So it's, its natural instincts are more towards the spiritual, not more, it's completely to the spiritual. The instincts of the soul is to daven, is to learn, to do mitzvahs. That's where the soul is coming from, the godly soul is coming from. So the person, the, the, now the person has to make a choice. The person has to make a choice. Are we going to give in and listen into the instincts of the animal soul? And, or are we going to listen to the instincts of the, of the godly soul? To make, the, to make a uh, sort of a discussion or, you know, within the person's conscience about, you know, uh, what should I do, what, I should, what should I not do? So Hashem infused within us, and again, these are very, very deep concepts, and I, I don't know if I'm being 100% clear with these things, and hopefully over the next few weeks it will become clear. Hashem put within us a little malach, a malach. And again, a malach is not an a human being is not a malach, but Hashem placed within our mind a little a little malach, a malach from the side of from the from the side of holiness, and a malach from the side of unholiness, from the side of impurity. These two malachim are not part of us; they're not who we are. When a person passes away, you are not your yitzatov, or and you are not your yitzahara. A yitzatov is an outside consciousness, a malach that Hashem has infused within our brain somewhere, somewhere very, very deep inside to create a conversation, to create a sort of outside force guiding us towards listening to the instincts of the godly soul and the Eight Sahara, which is also an outside force from the negative, from the side of impurity, talking to us and trying to convince us to give in to the instincts of the animal soul. So the animal soul and godly soul are just instincts, being pulling a person back and forth. But as far as the discussion, of the, the decide, what should I do, who should I listen to, that discussion that sometimes happens in our heads, that's coming from the world of Malachim, a positive Malach called the Tov and a negative Malach called the Yetzir Tahara. Hashem put that within us to sort of give us the ability of, of making the decision properly, of, of giving us a place of debating which instinct to listen to. But hopefully a person listens to the instincts, to the advice of the Yetzir Tov, who's telling you to give in to the instincts of the godly soul, and then when a person makes such a decision, then good, then you become a tzaddik, otherwise, otherwise not. This is what a person is comprised of. So in other words, what a person is is basically a body, an animal soul, and a godly soul. That's what a person is. As far as outside voices trying to convince us to do one thing over the other, that, those are outside forces called the Yetzitov and Yetzahara, coming from the world of angels, and that's what, that's, what makes, that's what makes a person. When a person passes away, 
Uh, obviously, the body is left behind. The animal soul is also pretty much left behind. What what a person carries with him, you know, into Olam Haba is the godly soul. Based on a person's choices down here, whether he gave in to the instincts of the animal soul, whether he listened to the Tzavi Sahara, so the godly soul is going to have to deal with those repercussions. And again, that's going to be part of the bigger discussion of what the Gulen are. I know that this is probably a little bit out there. I understand. So there's probably a lot of questions. Uh, but again, I just want to preface it by saying that it might have been confusing today, but it will, will become clear over, over the next 20 weeks. So if there are any questions, then uh, please feel free. Hello? Yeah, um, so I think, right, so Dovi, I think the question was, is there such a thing as a person having a bigger Yetzar than, than other people? So the truth is like this. Um, everyone is pretty much given a fair shot, a fair shot. However, there is no question that some people uh, struggle in certain areas more than others. So, I mean, for example, you could have one person who doesn't struggle with uh, keeping kosher. That's not his thing. He was never born with such temptations. He's not a foodie. He's not a person that really cares much about food. It's not his thing. It's not his thing. So in the world of kosher, of eating kosher, you would be, you would you could say that person doesn't have such a Sahara. And that's true. However, that same person who might not be tempted with uh, Burger King is very much tempted with Lush and Hara. You know, so everyone has their thing. So there's no question that everyone has their strengths and their and their weaknesses. And every single person is given a certain area, and this is what we're going to be talking about when it comes to reincarnation and so on. Every single person is given one area of Yiddishkeit that they're specifically that they specifically need to struggle with. And again, I don't mean that they're destined to fail, but there's something that's that some area of Yiddishkeit that their Yitzhara is very, very strong. And there's no question about it, that everyone has certain areas where there's a much more of a pull. The Yitzhara seems to be uh, convincing us more often and, and, and in a stronger way than other areas. And there's no question about it. Where that comes from, why is that? So that's going to be part of our discussion about, you know, the specific, uh, you know, mission that each Neshama has and, and so on. But, the, but there's, no, there's no question. There is truth to that. If a person finds himself more tempted than other people in a certain area, that's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of a mission in life, that that's part of your, part of your situation is that to deal with that specific area. And, you know, to have a person who struggles with all things, you know what I mean, that's very, very rare. It's not going to be common. Most people have certain areas that they struggle with and other areas that they don't struggle with and other people have the opposite. So everything sort of evens out in the end. But there's no question that there are certain areas of a person's life where a person feels a stronger pull to the Eight Sahara and to the animal soul. And in other areas, he feels a stronger pull to the godly soul and to the Eight Sahara. There's no question about it. And that's natural. It's normal. That's a completely part of being a human being, 100%. Okay. If there's any other questions, anybody else? Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So there's not going to be sheer next week. And the week after, I'll send that emails, but uh, the week after that, um, we'll see. We have to play that by ear. So we might be off for two weeks, but I'll be in touch, okay? Yeah, everyone.